weekly roundup. Um, quite an exciting week this week. Got quite a few good bits and pieces. Uh, I think first thing we have to look at is the uh, fac drop. Um, fac and a rata drop, really. I'm just going to load that up. <clears throat> Obviously, the 2020, 2019 errata for 40k drop recently. Yeah. <clears throat> It's really looking very nice. It's the April fact, but uh, I've only just managed to really get into it. Um, I really recommend checking it out. It's got some great updates in there. Uh, aircrafts no longer block uh, people moving as they used to because they're, you know, hundreds of feet up in the air and you're not. Which was always a bit of a confusing point. Um, most people, I think, were already playing to spirit of the rules. Some people were playing to letter of the rules. Using aircraft to block charge lanes just makes no sense. Um, so they've um, they've cleared up charging out of exploded vehicles. It was always something that was technically possible in 40k because there was no vehicle in your turn. You'd already disembarked in your opponent's turn. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a flaw that went away about that's actually been with us since fifth ed. Uh, I don't know if they fixed it in sixth ed. I don't think they did because I'm pretty sure I've used it against people because I'm a dick. <clears throat> but they said you can't charge out a vehicle once it's explodinated because it's just explodinated and you are dealing with the fact that your vehicle, which was there, isn't. Um, which makes sense, in, you know, really, because you, you're um, standing up, you're brushing yourself down, you're getting your weapon, making sure it still works. You, you don't have the time to just go and charge your opponent. Um, I have used it against some of my opponents, but in all fairness... The guy I use it again once put, uh, once in an apocalypse game, put his troops all the way around the edge, one inch apart, so we couldn't uh, <coughs> attack from the rear, which <coughs> sounds a bit dodgy, but then it's made even more dodgy by the fact that he was playing a massive Imperial Guard army and we were playing a Space Marine army. So basically it took away all the manoeuvrability that Space Marines were supposed to have by just occupying so much of the table. Um... Sadly, I think we're we? We're on twenty. No, yeah, yeah, twenty thousand points per side, uh, and the table we had wasn't big enough. It was ridiculous. Uh, it was his birthday, so we let him get away with it. But the game, I think, lasted four or five days before we just quit. Um, you know, when I say twenty thousand points a side, one of the side was pure Imperial Guard, nothing else, just pure Imperial Guard consisting of his entire collection and a friend's entire collection. Um, all Praetorians, so all with the white hats. Very, very cool, very, very thematic. But um, oh, it, uh, but um, they were both uh, infantry-based armies from 5th Ed. It was up, the amount of mo units was absurd, which, you know. But, you know, it's nice to know that things like, it's nice to know that things that I did, which were cheesy, can't be done anymore. Um, They've amended quite a few things. They've added Bolter Discipline, which uh, was already available, came out in a White Dwarf in February, I think. But now it's part of the Arathus, so everyone who didn't buy the White Dwarf can get it, and not all of us do buy White Dwarfs. Uh, White Dwarf is good, but for five or six quid, if you're not getting something out of it, sometimes it can seem a little costly. But, you know, still really cool, really happy that that's strong, really happy to see some improvements in, in the rules. Uh, other stuff going on with uh, 40k, we have got some do, 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 some Funko Pops coming up. Uh, just going to show you a picture of those. They're really quite nifty. Wow, there's way too much light there. Let's see if I can turn the camera to avoid the light. Yeah, there you go. Um, really quite nifty. You can see you've got a Space Marine, a Blood Angel, uh, an Ultramarine, and a Dark Angel. You can't quite tell the Dark Angel at the back um, because he's wearing a hood and a cloak and he looks a bit bit funky, but you can see the Dark Angel symbol on his shield. He's got a cybernetic eye, but for some reason has it strapped on like an eye patch. Oh, well. Uh, and the Space Marine has a nice facial tattoo. I like facial tattoos. I'd get one if I wasn't a chicken shit. Uh, and if I didn't need to feed a family of five. <laughs> uh, despite the day and age where I think people, st well, some employers still hold massive facial tattoos as a thing. Um, there's a special deal on Forge World. Uh, if you want to buy a Dreadnought, you get one arm free, which doesn't sound like much until you realise they charge at least a tenner for their arms. So yeah, if you're buying yourself a Legion Contemptor, you need two arms. Um, so it starts off 36, one arm is 46, two arms is 56, so that's £10 at least saved, uh, plus... Um, 
that's a significant, a significant uh, chunk of the cost percentile wise at the very least uh, yeah at least 20 well about 20 percent just under 20 percent yeah <clears throat> so if you're looking at getting a dreadnought and it's been just a little bit too expensive now's the time still a bit rich for my blood um that and i really like the dreadnoughts for the uh, primaris uh, chapter and i've got two of them now plus two knights so i'm actually fairly set for medium to large walkers um so that's pretty well medium walkers i've got the two of the small knights <laughs> um but yeah i mean that that's the stuff that's available in gw at the moment um nice price drop nice cheap thing and yeah really check out the errata uh infinity i'm um, looking at this month's releases we've got uh and act the Namor active response units, which are, I believe, hack. Oh, I'm gonna have to turn this. I believe hack is lamb, and I'm just gonna turn it so I don't get so much reflection there. Yep, which are a nice, uh, nice little hack thing. Um, it's an apothecary, and we all know that hack is lamb have the best doctors. Uh, let's have a look. <clears throat> We've got um, orc troops. I think that's just basically uh, an improvement. You got the uh, you got the big guy there. A little tack bot to help him, and uh, what looks like two basic troopers. Uh, which uh, will probably be cheaper than like things like the big five Demaru, sorry, four Demaru packs. I haven't checked out the price yet, but I imagine you're making a little bit of a saving there. And makes a lot of sense in what's known as a lance formation. Um, well, I say it's known as a lance formation. I assume they call it a lance formation because they work on ancient medieval terms. <laughs> Um, in ancient medieval terms, what they in ancient well in medieval times, what they do is they have a massive great knight, and then you'd have a couple of smaller men at arms and maybe a couple of unarmored you know, archers or guys with knives, and they basically just go around in what was known as a lance. Uh, hence the term freelance. Um, a lance would be uh, a lance would bear me a sec. <clears throat> a lance would be a uh, formation of the knight and his basic support guys a freelance would be one that wasn't bound to a king or a lord but could rent itself out as a mercenary um and a lot of knights did even ones that were um, attached to kings or lords would often do that because being a knight is really expensive um and again the orc troops uh as you can see from the picture are kind of set to work like that you've got one big badass and a couple of small guys to take out to take into account the fact that the big badass guy isn't necessarily that maneuverable or that easy to hide uh, and things like that <coughs> which is cool <coughs> we've then we then got uh, kit karan invincible zui young specialist um another badass for the um <coughs> my brain is just my brain is just farted no, nope. another badass building up the, um, god damn it, Scott. <sighs> no, not hackers on. <sighs> Bring it up, building up the guys that the JSA just left. Um, you know who I mean. Uh, in addition to that, we've got the Dynamo Light Cavalry, which would appear to be an Ariadna. Um, looking thing, the, these guys are another set of bikers for Ariadna. Uh, do, 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 forward Recon Mobile Attack Troops. Looking very similar to some of the previous guys. Slightly different. I'd imagine they're going with a different army. Where are we? Kazakh. Ah, like, uh, oh, right. They're the Kazakh version. They're, yeah, they're the Kazakh bikers. We've had our American Ard cases. Uh, not Ard cases. We've had our American bikers, we've had uh, a lot of other bikers. These guys are for the Kazakh army uh, and the Kazakh sectorial, which looks really, really good. Eugene, that's my there you go. Crit Cochran is another addition to the Eugene army. You know, as uh, as we know, um, the Eugene army used to be made up of um, two sectorials your basic vanilla Eugene, your uh, imperial, sorry. Yeah, your secret police sectorial and your uh, JSA sectorial. The JSA sectorial run off and done their own thing. They're still around. They're still very much supported. But it meant that all of a sudden the options available to vanilla um, Eugene players were reduced to the remaining things. So they brought out the Imperial Army and they're building that up. And that's very much taking the place of JSA. Um, 
not one for one. Most of the models are different and have a different style so that you haven't got two JSAs on the board, but they're uh, filling the holes that the departure of the Japanese sectoral army left in the Yujing um, space. In addition to that, the Daedalus Gate scenery pack is now available. Uh, it's a part of the Daedalus Gate <coughs> release we had a few months ago with the campaign set. Now the scenery pack's available <coughs> by itself. <coughs> the boards themselves that come with the scenery pack are a bit small. They're ideal for small skirmishes only, you know, three to four guys, maybe five. Um, they're not the 4x4 board you really want to be using, but uh, you can combine them up. Um, I've seen quite a few people just effectively wallpaper their boards with them to create sets, um, which is quite cool. And at £10, they're really very cheap in terms of uh, a complete scenery set. You do, get, you do get all of that in it. You have to make some assumptions as to if and where there are windows and how doors work and things like that. But me and my mates have found that we'll have some models that are on top of the boards that are actually on top of it, and some we'll put on top and we'll use flipped over tokens, like flipped over dug-in tokens or something with just IN written on there just to indicate they're inside the building and that they're in, you know, when you put them on the top, you put the token next to them, and that's just a perfectly adequate way of getting an idea of where they are inside the building for movement purposes. Um... Yeah, it allows you to get a lot of scenery on there really, really quite cheaply. So they're, they're always worth a look at. Uh, we've got the Saito Togan Mercenary Ninja, um, who's another cool person coming out with part of the mercenary things. And uh, oh, he's gone up, let's go down. Uh, another ninja. Uh, you can never have too many ninjas. I haven't checked out stats yet to see if he's available for JSA. Uh, they don't really need another ninja. But uh, as I said, I don't think you can have too many ninjas. And uh, the Master of Puppets expansion has come out for Aristia. <clears throat> Don't play Aristia myself. Keep meaning, again, keep meaning to get into it the same way as I mean to get into Titanicus, the same way as I mean to get into AOS, the same way as I mean to get into half a dozen games. One day I'll have the money for all the fun, but the day is not that day. But yeah, there's a lot of exciting com stuff coming out uh, from Corvus Belli over the next month, as they've been doing pretty much solidly. So that's really, really cool. Um... <clears throat> Moving on, uh, back to back to Games Workshop, but not Games Workshop. Um, Blood Bowl is a very common, uh, very popular game, and because it was unsupported by Games Workshop for so long, a lot of independent guys came out. And back in the day when these guys basically formed their companies, GW really didn't care. Uh, it wasn't something they were looking to make. It wasn't something they were making a profit on. And now they've come back... Um, They've not pushed themselves. They've not pushed themselves in. Um, we all know about we all know about GW's kind of litigious nature. They have, I can only assume, purposely held this back for Blood Bowl. Um, they ha they are aware that Blood Bowl has been supported by the independent manufacturer, the independent model makers, for more than a decade in its absence, and then to come in and just shut all those guys down would create enough bad feelings. You can hear Max there. Enough bad feelings that GW are smart enough not to do it, which is really good. Uh, it has meant that... Um, bear with me a second, we're just going to pause this. Hey, back, just uh, checking what's going on with my children, making sure they weren't killing each other. Uh, they were, but, you know, they get better. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, which is GW not pushing themselves. Um, they're still making fantastic stuff, and frankly, GW were undercutting most of their competitors just because of their manufacturing ability. But... Um, it has allowed a lot of the independents to continue to make things and thrive and enrich a game that a lot of people love. Uh, one of those guys is Grebo Games. I've um, shown you stuff they're bringing out before. They've got a lot of cool stuff. But one thing I'm going to do is just like let just let people know they've opened up their sponsorship request for 2020. So if you're out there anywhere in the world, I'd imagine, um, go and check out uh, what they're doing. Those I haven't checked out thoroughly myself. Um, yeah, basically, oh no, there you go. we set aside a budget for discounts and limited edition miniatures, etc, uh, etc. Et so it looks like something you're going to have to pay for, um, but you'll get it cheaper so that you can then, yeah, they're basically giving you a discount if you're buying anything as prizes or something like that. Um, they've created an order form to make the process official so that all parties can help each other, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I'd imagine there's going to be sort of a limited amount of stuff they can give away. And so yeah, they, they well, it says specifically they set a budget aside for discounts, limited edition miniatures, sculpting services, and everything else. 
that that might entail. So if you're holding a blood bowl uh, contest, particularly if it's a larger one, um, maybe look at these guys next year. Um, I know there's a lot of good stuff in Britain. We've got Thread Bowl. Uh, we've got the NEF, which is happening now, actually. Um, there's the European Championship coming up. There's a lot of big events around there. So if any of you guys are watching and uh, you know those and you're part of those events, check out Grebo Games. If any of you guys are watching and you're part of smaller events or you're trying to make bigger events, again, check out Grebo Games. Getting free stuff uh, or getting cool stuff, getting extra prize, getting limited edition models um, for your game is a great way of uh, upping the attendance because people will come for the goodies. You'd be surprised. I've run games myself and the difference between a game where you supply a goodie bag full of weird stuff and you just supply standard prizes or discount vouchers or something like that or things like that, even from, the, from a, a shop running perspective when I was running a shop running the games, the little goodie bags, the little odds and sods, the stuff they can't get anywhere else that you know isn't necessarily stuff you sell or isn't necessarily stuff that if you're a game, if you're a club that you can buy elsewhere, that is unique to the to uh, well, is either unique to you or limited in amount. People will travel that little bit extra just for the chance to get them. So there is really a good way of upping your attendance, and more players usually means more fun. Um, obviously, you've got a greater chance of uh, of netting that guy, but. Uh, Sadly, if you're running a tournament or if you're running or organising anything gaming-wise, you've got to deal with that guy eventually. <clears throat> what else have we got? Okay, a couple more bits and pieces. Uh, fifth edition bits and pieces. We've got a Kickstarter for the Ultimate Bestiary for fifth edition. Uh, another independent guy. Uh, this one's being done by Nord Games. Um, <clears throat> looks like this one's hit its pledge value, but... Um, Still worth checking out. Um, I'd imagine they're going to be in the shops at some point. So that's pretty. That's that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, this looks like a really cool thing that's going to be hitting the shelves. It's contain book contains over a hundred and thirty monsters, and they got stretch goals to add even more. Um, so God knows how many they're going to get. They needed five thousand. To uh, five thousand dollars to get this going, they got one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So expect to see this out at some point. Um, if you want it separately, check out the Kickstarter. A great way of getting guys to um, to move from Kickstarter to shop, even if they weren't originally planning it, is just say I will give you money. Um, people love it when you say I will give you money. If enough people email them and say I will give you money, then I'm sure they can work out a way of um, getting this produced again or doing an additional shop run or something like that. But there's cool stuff like that. Uh, Kickstarter, which is still going, which is one I'm actually much more excited about, is... <sighs> I'm going to make sure try and make sure I pronounce this right. If you're Korean and I don't pronounce this right, drop a little video in the hints and make, correct my pronunciation. But Choreo, the Hall of Adventures. The rest is in English, but it's just the Choreo. Um, basically, uh, a Korean uh, gaming world for 5th Ed. Um, I love 5th Ed. I love D and I love class. I love the classic elf, uh, dwarf, and orc thing. But it is really, really overwhelmingly that which is available, uh, particularly in Fifth Ed, because Fifth Ed is still relatively new. Um, which yeah, they they've already hit their uh, their pledge goal, so they're definitely going to be um, made. But this, you've still got eleven days, so you can go and back this project, get in there, and get some of this stuff. Um, Sadly, I don't know if I'm going to have money in that sort of period of time. I'm about to pay out various other things, including my ticket to Threadball. Uh, Threadball. So if anyone else is out there who's going to Threadball, I will see you there. I'm bringing dwarfs, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, back to Fifth Ed. Um, yeah, I, I love the orc and dwarf world. I love the classic fantasy, but um, there's so much stuff that is really just, if not European fantasy, massively European influence fantasy. You know, you get a few bits and pieces elsewhere, um, but the majority of stuff is either exclusive to D&D or just comes from kind of the European kind of worldview. And don't get me wrong, I love European fantasy. I love knights, I love the warriors. I love all the all the stuff in that. I tend to default to Faerun, or if I've got players that are picking my own kind of stripped down, unique version based on Faerun where you can include everything. But I, I do find that there is a there's a lot of limitation in just the Tolkien-esque 
um, just the Tolkien-esque stuff. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes from just the fact that almost every fantasy world has sprung from Lord of the Rings. It was such a, a pivotal and influential book that um, it has kind of limited... It's kind of limited fantasy in the same way that H.P. Lovecraft kind of ca uh, limits um, limits some of the sci-fi horror in that there are certain ideas, and if you get close to H.P. Lovecraft, things tend to lock in. Um, not anywhere near as much with H.P. Lovecraft because we've got uh, a lot of Japanese horror, a lot of Japanese guys that have come out. Um, and both those authors have written great stuff. Without them, we, we can fairly safely say that a lot of the genres that have sprung off wouldn't exist. But because... Tolkien was, was so influential because Lord of the Rings was so good. It does mean that you don't get maybe as much of, um, well, of non-Western influence stuff as I'd like. Uh, I mean, I remember Second Ed used to be resplendent with the stuff there. were. I, I remember having the Japanese source book with all the cool monsters like the Kappa, which are a vampire with a bowl in their head. And basically they're a, they're a fish man vampire. And the way they breathe on land is they take a bowl, you know, their head is kind of bowl shaped at the top and water sits in it and they breathe through the water. Uh, they were very strong, very powerful, but if you could knock them on their backs, that was it. They suffocated. Um, it's a bit mean, really. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, having the different stuff, having, I don't I, I hesitate to call it weird. It's just kind of weird from a westernized perspective where we don't kind of see a lot of that stuff. But having a lot of stuff from other cultures is really fun, really exciting. Um, yet yeah, Europe where a lot of this stuff originates from is a tiny portion of the world particularly when it comes to the amount of law that people split out um, and the amount of law that people basically just make up in, in, you know, in the early stages of their civilizations so having stuff inspired by Korea is amazing I want to see more stuff like this I want to see stuff inspired by Africa I want to see stuff inspired by Korea I want to see stuff inspired by Japan I really want to see more Japan stuff in Fifth Ed, in fifth ed. I'd imagine there's some... Uh, Guys out there, again, if you know any Japanese source books out there, put them down in the comments and uh, yeah, share that information or, you know, just share it with people you know. Uh, there's a lot of African stuff. The Anansi, the Anansi Spider uh, stories are really cool. If you're watching American Gods, um, the TV series, you can see they're bringing in gods from all over. And there, there is a lot of wiki, where, uh, there's a lot of weird and wacky stuff, but there's also a lot of awesome and cool stuff, um, you know. You always get a thing where you'll get a few wacky bits and pieces which are like, wow, that's really weird. You know, again, from a Western perspective. But there is a lot of actually solidly cool stuff that you know, can be handled in a sort of very respectful and very awesome way. So that you're not just playing something odd. You're actually playing something that's very rich and very in-depth. Which, frankly, is what I'm really looking forward to with the, with this book. Particularly as I don't know anything about Korean legends. I've, I looked, I've looked at a lot of other legends. Interested in legends from other countries. But I keep dealing my head for people, I don't know. Um, but uh, Korean legends are something that's new to me, so I'm really excited to see these guys, um, these guys get their stuff out. It's Fifth Ed Compatible, which is my favourite gaming system at the moment, um, by somebody called Arulian Lane, um, whose name I cannot pronounce. Uh, apologies, mate, I've probably just murdered your name, but... Um, yeah, there's plenty of room to back this project. There's plenty of room to keep going on this one. Um, looks like he's going to have some special edition stuff there. Uh, some awesome stuff. Uh, four detailed kingdoms, a new shaman class, uh, new class variants, new backgrounds, and new monsters, which is what we'd expect to see. <clears throat> I was talking about wacky and weird. You've got that little guy there with some sort of pudgy unicorn. That's cool, but hopefully he'll handle it It'll handle not just having some of the wacky and weird stuff to attract people, but it'll handle some of the other stuff in respectful ways. Yeah, you can see that picture there is much more, much more classic sci-fi, much more awesome. A unique spell casting system, uh, five element affinities, quick rituals, and various other bits and pieces. So that's really that's really cool. It's got a fully realized campaign setting, and uh, a lot of that stuff. So if you fancy a break from elves, dwarves, and the classic stuff, it looks like there's a um, there's another show in town, so check that out. Um, and uh, back him if you think it's cool. Um, okay, that's pretty much it this week. I uh, hope you guys... in. Oh, no. Sorry, tell a lie. Um, Warlord Games. I'm just going to see if I can get that up. Uh, I'm just going to pause it quickly while I get it up. I am back. Almost forgot. 
Obviously, we've got the D-Day celebrations coming up with the anniversary of D-Day. Um, don't tend to play too many uh, historical games, but I live in Portsmouth, so we've got celebrations which we're kind of going to be able to see. It's a bit weird. We had celebrations, everyone was invited, um, but now we've got the American president coming over and they're going to build a massive, great, solid walls around it for security reasons, so we're not really going to get to see our, our D-Day celebrations, which is a little sad. But, you know, I suppose security is necessary. Um, but with, uh, with D-Day coming up and the anniversary coming up, um, Warlord Games have released uh, D-Day Operation Overlord and the Longest Day Pack, which is going to have a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, a lot of stuff for running thematic D-Day themed games, you know, so you can be D-Day themed games, so you can go, you can run uh, Sword and Juno, have them interfet, interacting with each other, uh, move in further to the inland stuff. Um, with the um, the Longest Day battle set, uh, Wall of Tendry has a lot of battle sets themed around particular events. Not only are they great ways of getting into the game, they're great ways of getting... Um, stuff that's relevant to specific periods if you're into if you want to play a specific period and they're also great ways of really filling out your armies just because um there's a lot in them uh, it's 195 pounds for this set um 54 infantry figures three vehicles three artillery pieces 14 crew it's plastic and metal and will require assembly it's also a great way of if you're looking to do that kind of imperial guard army it's great at doing that. Remember, there will be a there will be a certain size creep because they're twenty eight mil and GW are thirty two mil. But unless you're putting them next to things like Catachans or um, some of the bigger chunky models, you can usually mix and match to a point where it, it isn't too jarring. Um, but yeah, um, there's a lot of awesome stuff out. Go check out Warlord Games and their D Day celebrations and see what you can get. Okay, uh, that is it for for this week. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you found something useful there. And I'll see you again next week. Oh, actually, one last thing. One, one last, last, last thing. Uh, quick apologies for last week. I did release um, a video last week because one of my cats got run over. Uh, sadly, it didn't make it. Uh, my whole day was taken up with that. And the next day was taken up with dealing with the fallout of that. So it meant I couldn't release a video. Uh, sorry about that, guys. And uh, hope you enjoyed this video. And hope you enjoyed the next one. Bye-bye. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video, and if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure why, but I am. Um, so, if you like it, see me there, and uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.